Magic and Mystery in Tibet by Alexandra David Neal Chapter 1, Part 3 A Grand Lama had passed his whole life in idleness. Although he had been given excellent tutors in his youth, he had inherited from his predecessors an important library and had, moreover, always been surrounded by men of learning. Still, he scarcely knew how to read. This Lama died. In these times, there lived a strange man, a miracle worker and rough-speaking philosopher, whose eccentricities, sometimes coarse, often exaggerated by his biographers, have given birth to a number of stories in the style of Rabelais, much appreciated in Tibet. Dugpa Kunlegs, for such was his name, traveled under the guise of a vagabond. Having arrived at the bank of a brook, he saw a girl who had come there to draw water. Suddenly, he attacked her, and without saying a word, he tried to violate her. The lass was robust, and Dugpa Kunglaze was approaching old age. She defended herself so vigorously that she escaped him, and running back to the village, she told her mother what had happened. The good woman was astonished. The men of the country were well behaved. None of them could be suspected. The brute must be a stranger. She made her daughter minutely describe the wicked wretch. After listening to the girl, the mother wondered. The description of the man corresponded in all points to that of Dungpa Kunglegs, the eccentricity and St. Lean Lama whom she had met during a pilgrimage. There was no possible doubt. Dugba Kunglegs himself had wished to abuse her daughter. She began to reflect on the strange behavior of the Holy One. The common moral principles which rule the conduct of ordinary men do not apply to the men of supernormal wisdom, she thought. A dubtob, D O U B T O B, is not bound to follow any law. Now there's a footnote here and it says a dubtob is a sage and wonder worker. Okay, so a dubtob is not bound to follow any law. His actions are dictated by superior considerations which escape the vulgar observer. So she said to her daughter, the man you have seen is the great Dugta. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. The man you have seen is the great Dugta Kunglugs. Whatever he has done, whatever he does, is well done. Therefore, return to the brook, prostrate yourself at his feet, and consent to anything he wishes. The girl went back and found the Dugta seated, seated upon a stone. <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> absorbed in his thoughts. She bowed down before him, excused herself for having resisted him when she had not known who he was and declared that she was entirely at his service. The saint shrugged his shoulders. My child, he said, women awake no desire in me. However, the Grand Lama of this neighboring monastery has died in ignorance, having neglected all occasions of instruction. I saw his spirit wandering out in the bardo, drawn towards a bad rebirth, and out of compassion I wished to procure him a human body. But the power of his evil deeds has not permitted this. You escaped, and while you were at the village, the asses in that field, field nearby coupled. The Grand Lama will soon be reborn as a donkey." The majority of the dead men heed the desire of their families as expressed during the funeral and do not return. The latter conclude that their fate in the next world, in the next world has definitely settled and probably to their satisfaction. However, some departed ones are less discreet. They frequently appear in dreams to their relatives or their friends, and strange things happen in 
their former dwellings. Tibetans believe that this shows the spirit to be unhappy and calling for help. There are Lama diviners who can be consulted in such cases. They order the rites to be celebrated, the gifts to be bestowed upon the clergy, <clears throat> the holy books to be read to comfort the unhappy spirit. Nevertheless, many people, especially in those remote regions near the frontiers, fall back on the practices of the ancient bonds, B-O-N-S. These are the shaman shamanist aborigines, the bonds. Okay. They think that the dead man himself should be listened to. So a medium, male or female, pawo or pamo, is summoned to lend his voice to the spirit to the departed one. Spiritualistic seances in Tibet do not resemble those of Western countries. Neither darkness nor silence are required. Sometimes they're held in the open air. The Pawa begins chanting, accompanying himself with a little drum and a bell. He dances first slowly, then faster and faster, and finally trembles convulsively. A being of another world, god, demon, or spirit of a dead person has taken possession of him. In a kind of frenzy, he utters broken sentences, which are supposed to convey that which the invisible being, being wishes to communicate to the assistants. Since it is of first importance to know exactly who is speaking through the medium and what he is saying, the most intelligent men of the village are called upon to listen attentively. It is sometimes happens that different gods or spirits take possession of the medium one after another. Once in a while, the latter, and under the impulsion given to him by one of these beings, will suddenly attack one of the public and beat him mercilessly. The correction is always accepted without any resistance being offered. Tibetans imagine that it is meant to drive out a demon that has lodged himself in the man without his being aware of it. The undesirable guest has, however, been discovered by the spirit animating the medium. The departed one who suffers no the departed ones who suffer in the next world usually limit their performances to giving an account of their misfortunes. At a seance where I was a spectator, I heard one say quote, I met a demon upon my road who dragged me into his dwelling. He made a slave of me, he forces me to hard work without stopping, and ill treats me, have pity on me, set me free, so that that I may reach the paradise of the great bliss. End quote. The mother of the man who was supposed to be speaking, as well as his wife and children, wept bitter tears. Families who receive supplications of this kind think of nothing but how to liberate the unfortunate captive. It is a complicated affair. First, one must get into communication with the demon and negotiate the ransom of his prisoner. The chosen intermediary is often a bon sorcerer. He informs the relative of the unhappy spirit that his demonical master demands the sacrifice of a pig or a cow, therefore setting him free. Having offered the victim the bond enters into a trance. Having offered the victim, the bond enters into a trance. His double, double in quotes, is supposed to visit the dwelling place of the demon. He travels. The way is long. It's hard, full of obstacles. This the sorcerer indicates by his contortions. But unlike the pawo, he remains seated, moving only his head and his bust. A flow of hurried w words are uttered, telling the various incidents of his adventure. He, he is even more difficult to understand than the Pawa. <laughs> the cleverest listeners find it hard to make out the sense of his words. The bond has accompanied his task. Now he has seized the spirit and prepared to take him away. The demon has received the ransom demanded, but he usually breaks faith and tries to hold on to his slave. The sorcerer fights him. One can see him struggling and panting, and one can hear his screams. The family and friends of the dead follow the phrases, the phases of the drama with greatest anxiety. They are overjoyed when the sorcerer declares, 
that he has been successful and has led the spirit to an agreeable place. But the first attempt does not always succeed. I have witnessed several performances where the sorcerer, after having simulated extraordinary efforts, declared that the spirit has been taken away from him by the demon. In this case, all right sacrifices and the payment of the bond fees must begin all over again. When a lama is called upon to save a spirit from slavery, no sacrifice is performed for redemption, and the rites that are celebrated ignore all negotiation. The lama, who is learned in the magic ri ritual, considers himself powerful enough to compel the demon to release his victim. Under the influence of Buddhism, the inhabitants of Tibet proper have given up sacrificing animals. This is far from being true of Tibetans living in the Himalayas, who have only a thin co coating of Lamaism and have remained practically shamanists. The belief of the learned Lamas and the contemplative mystics differ greatly from those held by the masses about the fate of the spirit in the next world. To begin with, they consider all the events of the journey in the bardo as purely subjective visions. The nature of these visions depends on the ideas of the man who has held them when he was living. The various paradises, the hells, the judgment of the dead appear to those who have believed in them. The gomchen, G-O-M-C-H-E-N, <coughs> excuse me, of Eastern Tibet told me the following story upon his subject. Upon this subject, the Gomchen of Eastern Tibet told me the following story upon this subject. Okay. A painter whose principal work was that of decorating temples often painted the fantastic beings with human bodies and animal heads who are supposed to be attendants of Shinji, S-H-I-N-J-E. His son, who was still a very young child, often stayed beside him while he worked and amused himself looking at the monstrous forms appearing in the frescoes. Now, it happened that the boy died, and entering the bardo, met the terrible beings whose images were familiar to him. Far from being frightened, he began to laugh. Oh, I know you all, he said. My father makes you on the walls, and he wished to play with them. I once asked the Lama of the Enche, E-N-C-H-E, what would be the post-mortem subjective visions of a materialist who had looked upon death as total annihilation? Perhaps, said the Lama, such a man would see apparitions corresponding to the religious beliefs he held in his childhood or to those familiar with him, held by people among whom he lived. According to the degree of his intelligence, and his post-mortem lucidity, he would perhaps examine and analyze these visions and remember the reasons which, during his lifetime, made him deny the reality of which now appears to him. He might thus conclude that he is beholding a mirage. A less intelligent man in whom belief in total annihilation was the result of indifference or dullness rather than of reasoning, or perhaps no see, vision, see no vision at all. However, this will not prevent the energy generated by his past actions from following the course and manifesting itself through new phenomena. In other words, it will not prevent the rebirth of the materialist. In many copy books filled with notes, showed no let me start the sentence over again my many copy books filled with notes showed that i had worked a great deal since i had come to sikkim s-i-k-k-i-m i thought i might allow myself a holiday summer was approaching the warmer temperature tempted me to undertake a trip to the north of the country the road i chose was an excellent mule track leading from gangkok to kampa zong and on to Shiganzi in Tibet, rising gradually from the traveler's bungalow of Dikchu 
I dicked you buried in the tropical jungle on the bank of Tista, T-I-S-T-A. It followed a tributary of this river up to its source, passing through enchanting landscapes. At about 50 miles from Gangtok, and at a height of 8,000 feet, this road crosses a village called Lachen, L-A-C-H-E-N, which occupies a prominent place in my experiences of Lamist, Lamaist mysticism. This little group of cottages is in the most northern Sikkim, the last which the traveler meets on his way towards the higher passes of the Tibetan border. It is inhabited by sturdy hillmen who combined a little farming who combined a little farming in the village with the rearing of yaks higher up on the Tibetan tableland, where they spend part of the year under tents. Perched on a high mountain slope, a humble monastery dominates the villagers' dwellings. I visited the day after my arrival, but finding nothing of interest in the temple, I was about to leave when a shadow darkened the luminous space of the wide open door. A lama stood on the threshold. I say a lama, but the man did not wear the regular monastic garb, neither was he dressed as a layman. His costume consisted of a white shirt down to his feet, a garment-colored waistcoat, Chinese in shape, and through the wide armholes, the voluminous sleeves of a yellow shirt were seen. A rosary made of some gray substance and coral beads hung around his neck. His pierced ears were adorned with large gold rings studded with turquoises, and his long black braided hair touched his heels. Hmm. This strange person looked at me without speaking, and as at that time I knew but little of the Tibetan language, I did not dare to begin a conversation. I only saluted him and went out. A young man, my general factotum, was awaiting me on the terrace of the monastery. As soon as he saw the lama descending the steps of the Peristel, behind me, he prostrated himself thrice at his feet, asking for his blessing. This astonished me, for the lad was not usually lavish with such signs of respect, and honored none in this way but the Prince Tulku and Burmiag Kushag. Who is this Lama? I asked him as I returned to the traveler's bungalow. He is the great Gomchen. G-O-M-C-H-E-N. One of his monks told me, while you were in the temple, he has spent years alone in a high, in a cave high in the mountains. Demons obey him, and he works miracles. And they say he can kill men at a distance and fly through the air. What an extraordinary man, I thought. My curiosity had been greatly excited by these stories regarding Tibetan Gamchens that I had read with Dawasandab. I had also heard a great deal from the Prince Tulku and from various lamas about the way of living of the Tibetan hermits and the curious doctrines they profess and the wonders they can perform. Now, I had most unexpectedly come across one of them. This was a lucky opportunity, but how could I talk with the Lama? My boy was utterly ignorant of Tibetan philosophical terms. He would never be able to translate my questions. I was annoyed and excited. I slept badly, troubled by incoherent dreams. I saw myself surrounded by elephants who pointed at me musical trunks from which came out deep sounds like those of the long Taban trumpets. This strange concert woke me. My room was plagued, in, no, it was plunged in darkness. I no longer saw the elephants, but I continued to hear the music. After listening attentively, I recognized religious tunes. The trapas were playing on the terrace of the temple. 
Who were they serenading that night? Hmm. Whatever might come of it, I wished to risk an interview with the Gomchen. I sent a request that he should see me. He would see me the next day, accompanied by my boy. I returned to the monastery. A primitive staircase led to the Lama's apartment situated above the assembly hall. In front of the entrance door was a small loggia, L-O-G-G-I-A, decorated with frescoes. While I, while waiting to be invited in, I examined these with some amusement. On the walls, an artist, endowed with more imagination than professional skill, <laughs> had presented had represented the, the torments of the purgatories, peopling the latter with a host of demons and victims who grinned and writhed in the most comical attitudes. In the middle of the panel, lust was undergoing punishment. <laughs> a naked man, abnormally thin, faced an unclothed woman. Her huge, disproportionate belly gave to this bell the appearance of an Easter egg mounted on two feet, toppled with a doll head, the lecherous sinner, incorrigible slave of his passions, forgetting where he was and how he had been led there, hugged the infernal creature in his arms, while flames, springing out of her mouth and from a secret recess, scorched him. <laughs> At a small distance from this couple, a sinful woman suffered her chastisement, bound in reverse posture to a triangle, pointing downward, she was compelled to accept the caresses inflicted upon her by a green devil with teeth like a saw and a monkey's tail, and in the background other demons variously colored were running towards were running forward to take their turn. <laughs> the Gomchen lived in a kind of dark chapel lighted only at one end by a small window, the ceiling supported by wooden pillars painted red. According to the Tibetan custom, the altar served as a bookcase. In a niche among the books stood a small image of Padmasambhava, P-A-D-M-A-S-A-M-B-H-A-V-A, -A -A, with ritual offerings placed before it. Seven bowls filled with pure water, grain, and a lamp. Incense sticks burned on a small table, mingling, mingled their mystic fragrance with the odors of tea and melted butter. The cushions and rugs piled up for the master to sit upon were threadbare and faded, and the tiny gold star of the altar lamp, shining at the back of the room, showed up its dust and emptiness. Through my boy acting as interpreter, I tried to ask several questions on subjects that I had discussed with the lamas that I had met at Gangtok, but it was useless. If only Dawasar, Dawa, Dawasandap had been with me. The young man was confounded and unable to find words to express ideas whose meaning he could grasp whose meaning he could not grasp. I gave it up, and after a long time, the Lama and I sat facing each other in silence. The next day, I left Lachen, continuing my journey towards the north. Here, the scenery, which all along the track lower down had been charming, became simply marvelous. The azalea and rhododendron thickens were still decked with their bright spring garment, a shimmering torrent of blossoms submerged the valley and seemed to be pouring out on the various slopes a resistant no a resistless flood of purple, yellow, red, and pure white waves. Seen from a distance, my porters, whose heads only emerged from the bushes, seemed to be swimming in a sea of flowers. A few miles farther, the fairy-like gardens gradually grew thin and scattered till a few rosy patches only remained here and there where dwarf bunches of azaleas struggled obstinately for life against the dizzy heights. The track now entered the fantastic region near the frontier passes. 
In the intense silence of these wild, majestic solitudes, icy, crystalline, purling brooks chatted gently. From the shore of a melancholy lake, a gold-crowned bird solemnly watched my caravan as it passed. Up and up we went, skirting gigantic glaciers, catching occasional glimpses of crossing valleys filled by huge clouds, and then, without any transition, as we issued from the mists, the Tibetan tableland appeared before us, immense, void, and resplendent under the luminous sky of Central Asia. Since then, I have traveled across the country, lying behind the distant mountain ranges, which at last, which at that moment bound my horizon. I have seen Lhasa, Shigatse, the northern grassy solitudes with their salt lakes as large as seas, Kham, K-H-A-M, the country of brigand knights and magicians, the unexplored forests of Po, and the enchanting valleys of Tsarang, where the pomegranates ripen. But nothing has ever dimmed in my mind the memory of my first sight of Tibet. A few weeks later, the weather changed. The snow began to fall again. My provisions were on the verge of giving, up, giving out. Porters and servants grew irritable and quarrelsome. One day, I had to use my riding whip to separate two men who were fighting with knives for a place near the campfire. After a few short excursions into Tibetan territory, I left the frontier. I was not equipped for a long journey, and moreover, the land that lay in front of me was forbidden ground. Again, I crossed Lachen, saw the Gomchen, and talked with him about his hermitage. That was a day's march distance higher up in the mountains. He had lived there for 17 years. These plain details my boy could easily translate, and I myself could follow a certain amount of this conversation. However, I did not risk mentioning the demons said, I did not risk mentioning the demons said by popular opinion to be his servants. I knew my young interpreter was too superstitious to dare to approach the subject, and probably also the Lama would not have answered such inquiries. I returned to Gantok, sad at having missed the opportunity of learning things of real interest regarding the mystery of the Tibetan anchorites, which I had skirted by chance. I did not in the least foresee the curious consequence of my trip. A little while after this, the Dalai Lama left Kalimpong. His army had beaten the Chinese, and he was to go back to Lhasa in triumph. I went to bid him farewell at a hamlet situated below the Jalap Pass, J-E-L-A-P. I arrived ahead of him at the bungalow where he was to stop. There I found many noblemen of the Shikamese court in great distress. They were in charge of the preparations for the short stay of the Lama King, but as is usual in the East, everything had come too late. Furniture, rugs, hangings were not in place, and the distinguished guest might appear at any minute. Everything was in confusion in the small house, with masters and servants running, rushing wildly about. It amused me to lend a helping hand and to arrange the cushions that would serve the Dalai Lama for a bed. Some of the assistants assured me that this would bring me good luck now and in lives to come. Here I had another opportunity of talking with the Tibetan sovereign. His thoughts seemed entirely directed towards political affairs. As usual, he blessed the devotees with his duster made of ribbons, but one felt that his mind had already crossed the mountain pass which marks the frontier and was busy organizing the profits of his victory. 
The following autumn, I left Sikkim for Ni Nepal and later on spent nearly a year in Benares. I had made a long stay there in my youth and returned with pleasure. I gratefully accepted the kind offer of the members of the Theosophical Society to rent me a small apartment in their beautiful park. The aesthetic simplicity of this lodging was in harmonious keeping with the atmosphere of the holy city of Shiva and quite suited my taste. In these congenial surroundings, I assiduously resumed the study of the Vedanta philosophy, somewhat forsaking Lamaism, which I did not seem to be able to investigate more thoroughly than I had already done. I had no thought of leaving Benares when an unexpected combination of circumstances led me one morning to take a train going towards the Himalayas. And that concludes chapter one. And looking at chapter two here, it's title is A Guest of the Lamas. So I hope you're enjoying this. And uh, if you are, please like and subscribe as it would help me a lot. Till soon.